All right, everyone. This is Hack Club AMA. Welcome to a very special AMA with Harvard CS50 professor David Malin. Hi, David. Hello, Maggie, everyone. Nice to see you. Thanks for having me tonight. I'm Maggie, and I'm a high schooler and programmer from the Bay Area in California. So before I get started, I just wanted to give some quick background info on David. He teaches CS50 at Harvard, and the course has a ton of super fun demonstrations like ripping apart phone books or binary bulbs, and a ton of debugging ducks in order to explain programming concepts, which I found super cool while taking it. And he has also previously worked as a forensic investigator and also founded two startups. Nice. I see Raymond, you have your duck debugger there at the ready already. Uh, Lucas, are you able to unmute and introduce yourself? If not, I can. All right. I'm Lucas, a teenage programmer from Sao Paulo, Brazil. And wait a sec. My Zoom is a little. Uh, uh, English is not my my first language, but I really wanted to host it tonight. Likewise, thanks for having me as well. well. We've had a lot of our teaching fellows and certainly students from uh, Brazil as well. Uh, so, David, thank you so much for joining us today. One question I had for you is, like, CS50 all, already has a bunch of awesome, like, tech working on it. I know you guys have a bunch of different camera angles to make the experience online almost as good as it is in person, I guess. Hmm. So if money wasn't an issue, what technology would you use or what new technology would you develop in order to make the online experience even better? Yeah, that's a really good question. So jumping right in, in lectures in Sanders Theater, where we teach the class, we've long had either a traditional projector screen that's up above my and all the students' heads so you can see everything at scale. And in recent years, we've also had a big TV of sorts on stage, either a touch screen or just a generic TV that's about 84 inches total, which is pretty good. And it looks better when we're filming, for instance, me walking through code there than just awkwardly pointing up at the sky where the projector is. But I have long wanted one of those massive video walls that you might have as a really cool conference like WWDC for Apple or Google I.O. or the like. Um, unfortunately, they're crazy expensive, uh, and also because we're in this beautiful historical theater, we can't really set it up and then tear it down uh, for each and every class just to get it in and off the stage. So it's just not really practical, um, but I think that's one of the first things that comes to mind. Um, a few years ago, when virtual reality was starting to catch on and Google Cardboard was a thing, if you're familiar, we started experimenting a few years ago with uh, exactly that, filming CS50 in uh, 360 degrees originally, then ultimately 180 degrees, so you could look up, down, left, and right, and sort of see and feel the theater. Um, that was kind of before its time, because even with uh, fancier headsets like HTC Vive or uh, Facebook's hardware, Oculus, you, uh, the screens weren't really high enough quality to have really good fidelity and see what's going on on stage and also see what might be on your laptop virtually or otherwise. So I'm hoping in a few more years, um, we'll actually be able to create all the more of a realistic experience for students who can't come to Harvard, who can't come to Cambridge, Massachusetts geographically, so that you can really feel like you're there even when you're not. And that's true for so many other aspects of life, not just schooling, but to really have a first class experience when it comes to virtual reality. So that too, someday. All right, thank you so much. That would be very cool if we could just like experience CS50 online, almost as if we are actually there in person. So I guess now I'll open it up to the group. Does anyone have any questions for David? And just raise your hand. And when I call on you, you can say your name and where you're from and ask your question. OK, so first I see Arpan. Hey, David. Hello. Hello. This is going to be a bit of a cliche question, but how exactly was CS50 started? Like, what were the rules that got this ball rolling? Can you say it again? Your your microphone's a little muffled for me. 
Uh, yeah, how exactly was CSFC started? Like, what was the moment or what was what was it that got the ball ball rolling about CSFC? I'm sorry, I'm still having trouble parsing it audibly here. Do you mind typing it into the chat and let me field it that way? The audio sounds a little cloudy for me here. I think Arpan asked how you like started CS50 and how it got started. Ah, thank you. Okay, and Arpan, I see your chat message now as well. So CS50 has been a class at Harvard since 1989, which is before my time. Uh, I started college in 1995, and I actually took CS50 myself in 1996, so just under 10 years of the class existing. And then fast forward until 2007, I started teaching the class after I finished my PhD in school. And for me, therefore, CS50 started both as a student in 96 and then as a teacher in 2007. And it really was in 2007 that we started to reinvent the class and start trying out new ideas that were of interest to me, to the teaching fellows that year. We began to change a lot of the homework assignments, which we call problem sets or programming projects, so that they were much more real world uh, inspired. So instead of having very traditional computer science problems like you might have in a traditional textbook or in high school, um, we started to try to contextualize them. So one on forensics, uh, Maggie mentioned earlier my time with the DA's office. And so having students write code in C that can recover some photographs that have either been deliberately or accidentally deleted. Uh, we started introducing topics like cryptography, so you can scramble information by writing code or unscramble it to decrypt messages as well. Uh, we introduced web programming into the class at the very end of the class so that students who, of course, are now using the web every day and using mobile devices, which are using similar technologies, they could actually make not just sort of underwhelming command line programs and black and white terminal windows, but they could actually make full-fledged web interfaces as well. So sort of got the course itself started in 89. I myself experienced it in 96, and then we began to evolve it uh, for the past 15 years, starting in 2007. Okay, thank you. And a reminder to everyone, if you want, you can turn on your camera. And if you have any questions, raise your hand in Zoom. All right. I think Lucas had a question. All right. Uh, professor, uh, you can offer only one piece of advice to a new student a new student taking CS50. What is it? Leave yourself enough time to do the work. Um, programming is no fun, at least for me, and statistically for most of CS50 students, if you're under time pressure and if you're under stress. And I've been programming now in some form for 20 years, and somehow or other, it always takes longer still than I think it will. Not just to do like some homework problem, but just to like build some command line application, make some web application, do something in mobile, because there's just always stupid stuff that you run up against, like uh, some bug in your own code and you're just not seeing it. And you really need to allow yourself the luxury of like going to sleep or go take a jog or take a shower or just something to disconnect you from the computer screen so that you can just kind of think about either something else altogether or at least take a step back so that you don't make the problem worse. And I say this having in college when I took CS50 itself. Eventually, after a few weeks, I realized empirically that I just got stupider after midnight. And so if I were cutting things too close to the deadline and programming until midnight, 1 a.m., 2 a.m., like I was generally making the program worse and not better. And the only solution consistently I eventually figured out is you, I've just got to go to sleep, but I have to have enough time the next day before the deadline or the next weekend before the deadline to actually get the job done. So if you find that programming is hard or it just takes a lot of time, like honestly, that's normal. And I'm not sure that's ever going to go away. And sometimes it's not even your bugs, like even more frustrating perhaps is when you're using third-party libraries, code that other people wrote, 
and there's some stupid bug in that library and maybe you're the first one to even discover it and so now you go down this rabbit hole of going on github and maybe opening an issue and documenting it for other people and that can take an hour for instance and it's fun i mean that's kind of a project unto itself but it's completely steering you away from finishing your own goal so the best advice honestly i think when you're a student or just a professional is just allocate enough time for the unexpected because it's going to happen if you're like me uh well after school is finished yep oh, definitely great. Uh, thank you. Sure. Uh, um, uh, I was uh, so excited for this because my school did not offer coaching classes. So it's uh, how I learn by uh, computer, computer science. It's uh, because CS50. I love oh, okay. <laughs> Dex, uh but it's so expensive for me. I'm in Brazil, so oh, shipping, it's so expensive. So I have a paper deck. Oh, that's great. That's even better if you made it yourself. I like it. Thanks. OK, Felix? Oh, sorry. We can't seem to hear you. You're unmuted, but maybe your microphone. Do you hear me now? Yeah, now we can hear you. I, uh, hello, David. Uh, my name is Felix. I'm from Montreal, Canada. And I would like to know, um, do you have any like tips or advice for someone who would like to go do like a PhD in computer science um, from your past experience? Yeah, it's a good question. I think if you're depending on the school you go to, especially if it's a research oriented school, it absolutely tends to help to have prior research experience. So from college or from your undergraduate university days. So if you are hoping to do a PhD and you're not yet in college, um, when you go to college or university, I would focus on eventually, it doesn't have to be the first year, but finding courses that have projects like final projects uh, that are ideally open-ended too. So you can kind of explore and find something of interest to you. Try to find either um, research opportunities or even part-time or full-time job opportunities with professors, either during the school year or maybe over the summer or over winter break, something like that, just so that you get to know someone better. And best yet, even though the, most students probably don't do this, best yet would be by senior year in university to like actually have your name on a paper. So if you're working with a research group, they uh, want to share knowledge with the world and publish a paper at a conference. If you can contribute enough that your name goes on that paper, even better, because I think this helps one with a demonstrated interest in research Two, it gives you a sense firsthand of like what a PhD would actually be like. Um, and three, it just connects you with other faculty, with other researchers so that you have a network of people, if small initially, uh, to whom you can turn for recommendation letters and just references ultimately. So that's great that you're thinking about it so early on. Thank you. Okay, I see Katie. Last question. I think we're not, I'm not hearing you, Katie, at all, even though you're on mute, your mic is on. Think Katie, I, at least I'm not hearing you still. Maggie, are you? Yeah, I can't seem to hear you. Katie, do you want to type your question in the chat? And Arpan, I see in the chat too that you got into programming from CS50. That, that's great. And Odysseus, let me uh, defer to Maggie for calling on folks in the chat or on camera. Okay, while Katie is typing in the chat, let's have Dan unmute. Hello. Hello. Hello, uh, do, uh, Mr. David Jimalan. So nice to uh, from meet you, uh, US, uh, Florida. So technically, uh, I kind of missed out for the course, but uh, I still stick around just 
to ask you a couple of questions. So, sure. Yeah, glad to have you. You, you. I remember that you, know, you mentioned that you have a couple of starts up on a tech, on the tech field, right? A couple of startups, did you say? Yes, sir. Yeah, when I was in graduate school, I tried to incubate a couple of small businesses. One was actually related to the district attorney's office work, where I started trying to recover data from people's hard drives if they had dropped a laptop or if the hard drive simply died or was malfunctioning. Um, and then the other was tutoring specific. So I started to hire local tutors to work with students in the area around Cambridge and Boston on various subjects, computer science among them. And at the time, I actually wrote a lot of software myself for not only the website for the company, but also to use like PayPal's API for doing automatic billing and actually paying the, the tutors themselves, built this like calendaring software so that the tutors could tell me when they're available, sort of like Google Calendar now is, wasn't as popular at the time, uh, via drag and drop, uh, they could tell me their schedule. So there was this whole like software backend to uh, that business in particular, but they were only during the duration of uh, grad school for me. Uh, do you have any uh, advice for startups? up? Yeah, in general, yes. For ideas, I would turn to your own interests. I think for me, the problems, the both of the, the businesses were motivated by just like real world problems that I saw around me. Like it felt like people were constantly asking for re recommendations for tutors. Uh, there were constantly students looking for part time jobs. And so like that just felt like a business opportunity, certainly, and was certainly in my comfort zone and that I was going to school and was an academic and so it was just a very familiar field in that sense. And same thing with the district attorney's work. Like I had kind of learned through that experience and by working with colleagues at Harvard, how you can analyze hard drives and recover data that's been deleted. And so that too became an, a frequently asked question. People I knew would ask me if I can help them solve this problem. And so it seemed that if my people I knew were asking for such, maybe there's a business opportunity there. So I wouldn't try to focus so much on like struggling to come up with an idea. I would just like literally keep your eyes and ears open and listen and look for problems around you. And if you think you with a bit more technical savvy than friends and people around you can solve that problem, then go for it. And I'm sure you'll find once you start noticing that there's a lot of problems like that. Yeah, I've been thinking about um, startup on making like software application like, you know, JetBrains. Mm -hmm, sure. You kind of like it. So I just want some advice on that. But thank you for your answer. Yeah, I mean, to elaborate slightly, I would think about like who your customer is going to be like, it's, it's fine if it's just a fun idea, like a hack project. But if you actually want to do it as a startup or a business, like definitely give some thought as to who would pay you for that and what they would want you to solve. All right, thank you. So, Sahidi, do you want to ask your question? Sure. Hi, David. My name is Sahidi, and I am a hack clever here in Georgia. And something I really was wondering about is, so I honestly feel like people's um, ethical values drive them every day, whether like it's per per personal or professional lives, like the core values you hold are mm -hmm. something that like drives you um, everywhere. So like what's something that you hold dear to you and what's something you try to remember as you work or hang out with people in your life? Yeah, oh, that's a good one. Um, so particularly since in CS50, both on campus and off, we focus so much on academic honesty and on teaching students and expecting students to submit work that's only their own, not to have plagiarized from the internet or friend or the like, the more I've sort of lived in that headspace with my colleagues and with my classes, like the much harder it is for me in the real world to tell like any form of lie, you know, certainly as a kid and probably as an adult, I might, you know, take some liberties with explaining things, not academically or in professionally per se, but you know, when you're in a store and answering some question about, you know, when you bought it and if you're actually outside the return window or something, you know, stupid like that, but real, uh, which isn't truthful, like those things really weigh on my mind nowadays. And so I think this 
sort of devotion to honesty so that I, it, you know, at least I'm not a hypocrite when it comes to my own work and what we're doing professionally, like that really sticks with me. And, you know, I think back on childhood and I'm sure that was informed by certain experiences when I did lie in some stupid context and got caught. And so there's the punitive aspect, but I think there's something to be said at some point along the way, just starting to feel guilty about that and sort of internalizing that and realize like, I don't want to feel this way. And so therefore, like hard as it is to just, um, you know, just be more truthful. So I think that's kind of a, um, I think per, like personal life has fed into professional life in that way. Thank you for that answer. Sure. Okay. And a question from the chat. So Odysseus said, did you learn CS fundamentals in university, high school, or by yourself? Definitely university, not in high school for me, and definitely by myself. Um, I did not take any computer science classes when I was a high school student. My school did offer one or more classes, but I never really knew what they were. And I never really had an interest in computer science or programming. Like I was definitely a geeky kid growing up and also shy and really liked computers and had a Commodore 64 when I was really young, had a Mac Plus uh, when that came out sometime in the 80s and then had Macs and then eventually PCs as well. So I was like very fortunate to have access to like computers as a kid, both at school and at home. But I never really took any kind of academic interest in them or any interest in using them creatively as opposed to just using the software that was installed on them or that I could buy or my parents could buy from the store back in the day before there was an internet and install on those computers. And so it wasn't until high school that I could have taken CS but didn't. In fact, I still have burned into my memory recollections of like walking past the computer lab and like, you know, scoffing at my nerdy friends who were in that room kind of hunkered over typing away at the keyboards. And I just had no idea or interest in what they were doing. And it wasn't until college when I took CS50, my sophomore year of university, that I actually realized just how much fun and creative and empowering it could actually be. But beyond my college or university classes, like a lot of my knowledge was self-taught. Certainly when it comes to programming, I took maybe two, three classes on programming specifically, and that was it. Like everything else in the software space has been self-taught, asking friends lots of questions, lots of Googling, Stack Overflow and the like. But I think it is very valuable if you're fortunate enough to be able to take formal classes, either through hack club like programs or in high school or in university, just to have some structured learning. So you have ideally some experts kind of leading you through the basics and the fundamentals. And from there, I think you can take it yourself. All right, thank you. So Holden, do you wanna ask your question? Uh, all right. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Holden, and I'm from North Carolina. Um, um, I'm in eighth grade, and I recently uh, took CS50 online at the same time as my brother, who uh, took it in person, uh, which was really awesome. Oh, nice. Uh, yeah. So uh, what I'm wondering is, like, how can I uh, stay focused on projects? Because I kind of struggle with finishing things if I don't have, like, a strict deadline. Yeah. I mean, so this actually is the value, I think, of actually taking more traditional classes at universities or local clubs is you just have someone playing bad cop and like telling you what to do and when to do it by. Like there's some healthy pressure there. Um, it's funny that you took it with your brother, because I imagine you could have you could or did use that as an opportunity to synchronize with him and maybe take it along with him. And if that's not an opportunity in general for folks, you know, <laughs> I, I kind of like jogging and I also hate like I hate jogging like for exercise. And yet, if I invite a friend to do it with me, like I just feel guilty. So maybe guilt is drives a lot of what I do virtuously. Um, like if I convince a friend to go with me, then I don't want to disappoint them. So I'm going to show up and I don't want to embarrass myself by being horrible at it. So I try to do better. And I would imagine you could try to do the same, even with things like programming or projects, like make a promise to someone that you are going to finish this or ask them to do it with you or ask them to, uh, you know, gift you something if you succeed or punish you in some way, like take something away from you if you don't, like just kind of put some skin in the game somehow. And even if it's just kind of a super, uh, a, a stupid external pressure, like it kind of works. And so just doing that, um, adding some external pressures might go a long way there, either positively or negatively. All right. Uh, thank you. Sure. Okay, and Katie has typed her question in the chat. So she said, 
When starting a new project, what steps do you take to get started and make it a less daunting task? Oh my God, I usually postpone it for weeks and weeks until I finally uh, get around to taking it on. Um, so that's something I'm trying to get better at. Um, I think the real trick for me at least is to like bite off small pieces first because one, you just feel like you're making some forward progress even if it's the silliest of features. Like you just do the HTML for a website that doesn't actually do anything, but at least you've kind of gotten over that activation energy to get things started. And what I do think is helpful too, if you're a fan of GitHub or GitLab or any of those code hosting services, like start making a to-do list for yourself in terms of issues, for instance, using GitHub terminology so that you really have a checklist of things to do. And I think that forces you to quantize things, like break it up into smaller pieces. And you can quantize things as like features, as sort of like requirements, eventually as bugs or actual issues. And honestly, there's this sick gratification, I think, of just like checking something off, checking something off. And even if it takes you five minutes, it just kind of feels good. And there's a bit of a, you know, a rush from doing that, that I think incentivizes me at least to then want to do, all right, I'll do two tasks tonight, or I'll do three tasks tonight. But I think really breaking it down, but concretely using a checklist, using task management software, using GitHub will perhaps help structure those goals, those milestones. Let's see, Maggie, back to you. Thank you so much. Okay, so next is Raymond. Uh, hi, I'm Raymond. So I'm from Singapore. Um, if it looks like I just woke up, I just did. Uh, <laughs> but anyways, uh, I'm. I have a question about uh, what are some of the boring projects that you see on final project like for EDX on EDX. What are some of the best projects? No, more more of the boring projects like what I always made on there oh interesting well i like to say that we love them all equally so i don't think it would benefit anyone for me to impugn any types of projects um i will say on campus which you're not quite asking about but i'm more comfortable speaking to projects we see many of on campus um things that just solve common student problems like it's very common to make an application that shows people the dining hall menus. It's very common to make an application that shows when the next like shuttle buses are coming on campus. It's very common to make a program that makes it easy to uh, browse for the course catalog, what courses one can take. And ironically, like I personally am guilty of having made all of those pieces of software at some point. So we just see a lot of them and it's not bad. I mean, each of those has some really interesting technical possibilities and sort of challenging problems. So like they are good exercises. We just see a lot of them. So when tackling projects, whether it's for an in-person or online class, like I would just think about what makes you a little bit different and like, what do you do that maybe most everyone else doesn't? And so case in point, one of the projects that I'm most proud of that some of you might've even heard me mention if you've taken CS50 all the way through, I mentioned toward the end that one of my activities in university was to uh, help lead with my roommate the freshman intramural sports program. So the sort of optional program for kids who weren't super athletic, but wanted to do sports with each other. Like I made the first website for that program and it was dynamic. You could like sign up for things. You could uh, see a tournament bracket and where you stood. And so like that was different. Like no one else at Harvard had made something like that. And so it was this sort of personal interest to me that helped me stand out. So I think the best projects are really those that are informed by someone's personal uh, traits or goals or jobs, whatever it is that makes you, you. Hmm. That, that answers my question, but what about the best projects on there, like on the uh, campus? The, the best projects or the bad projects? The best projects. Oh, the best ones. So there too, I love them all equally, but I think the ones that tend to stand out because of their distinction are when students go well beyond what we have taught them in CS50 and they maybe use some Arduino hardware, or they use something with like virtual reality goggles, especially a few years ago, or they take some piece of hardware, or they take a musical instrument and connect it somehow to their computer via MIDI or Wi-Fi or whatever. Like that's always really interesting for me. And I think all of the other attendees, because they go above and beyond what uh, their classmates might've even thought was possible. Uh, so in CS50, for instance, we end the course, as I mentioned, with a bit of web programming and many students sort of build their project on that last problem set, which is very much intentional. Like we encourage students to do that because it's the best way to sort of take an incremental step forward. 
but it's always impressive when students take like two or three steps forward just because they're willing to take more of a, a risk and learn something more on their own. Yeah, thank you. Sure. All right. So due to technical issues, Lucas had to switch to his phone, but we had a question for you. Okay. Where do you get all the ducks, both the rubber ducks and also the giant like inflatable duck? Uh, you know, that's a really good question. Okay, so the rubber ducks, I can paste a link into the chat here. We buy them in bulk um, from a local company. And if you genuinely want to know, we can I can find out and email you afterward if you want to buy ducks in bulk. We do make them available uh, for individual purchase for folks uh, via that website, but we do give them out to students here in person and when we travel for hackathons and events and the like. The big inflatable duck, uh, version one of that just came from Amazon, like we found on Amazon.com, a five foot duck. Uh, we since graduated to, maybe that was a six foot duck, we since graduated to an eight foot duck um, that we found had to find on eBay, especially during the pandemic, there was not much supply of massive rubber ducks, uh, so they've been harder to find. Nice. I think these ducks are definitely something we're going to need to have at our next hackathon or something. So the next person is Manuel. Hello, David. Hello. Nice to meet you. My name Hi. is Manuel and I'm from Chile. My English is not so good. Um, so I will leave my question on the chat. Oh, yes. sí. Yeah. And está bien. Uh, hablo un poco español, pero uh, ah, hablo mejor en el inglés. Mejor que yo. <laughs> uh, so my question is, do you see the implementation of programs related to AI in primary education? And if it would be feasible to add program from the first years of school? So let me answer the second question first. Absolutely. I, I think it's very realistic to introduce students to programming very early on. Uh, we ourselves use Scratch at the university level in CS50, but that's a very common way for younger students to get an exposure to programming. There's Scratch Junior, which is for even younger students, and there's many other types of technologies like MakerBot stuff and um, and uh, like Alice and any number of other graphical programs. I would just be where spending too much time with young students on the same platforms. I feel like a lot of adults, a lot of teachers, a lot of classes, like just spend forever on like basics and don't have high enough expectations of younger students. And so, I mean, we case in point, granted at the university level, we use Scratch for one week and then we move on to something that's more sophisticated, but more traditional and more challenging. For younger students, I would spend more than just one week on something like Scratch but I don't think I'd use it for like an entire year. I mean, come on, like after a few weeks or a few months, even the youngest of students, I think are probably ready to try something new and probably educationally, but I'm no expert at that age group, probably it's diminishing returns with each passing week. It might still be fun, but maybe they're not learning as much new stuff each week. And so I think a progressive introduction of newer languages, uh, more uh, sophisticated tools, software tools, would be a very good thing, even at the youngest of levels. Um, ideally, so that students are not taking CS50 when they get to university, they've done something like it or it many years earlier. And as for AI, I mean, so life's going to get really interesting quickly, I think, now that we do have uh, proofs of concept like ChatGPT and GitHub Copilot, which are getting pretty darn good, pretty darn fast. I think the real opportunity there will be to have much more personalized online learning that's possible too, where you actually have a good AI, a good chatbot that sort of answers questions that you have when you're confused as a student, or maybe helps point out bugs in your code. And doesn't just fix things for you, because that's not really an inspiring solution, but sort of guides you like a good teacher would. I think that's going to be pretty game changing, especially for so many of you maybe that don't have computer science programs or courses at your school. You have online courses like CS50, but we have so many darn students online. We, of course, can't give it the ideal amount of personal human attention to everyone. And so AI, hopefully in a few years, is going to get pretty darn good. So you can have a much closer approximation to like a dedicated teacher helping you in a good way. So we shall see how Thank soon. Thank you. This is my, sure. my question. Mucho gusto. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you so much all for your 
awesome questions and we have a ton but we need to sort of get through most of them so it'd be great if you guys could keep it short so next abby do you want to ask your question hi i'm abby i'm 16 i'm from los angeles i was actually going to ask about your thoughts on gpt3 and ai integration with like learning but you kind of just answered it so i'm just curious like if you could talk a little bit about like a book that you think every student should read that's a really good question and I'm embarrassed to say I don't read enough in recent years uh that was another good thing of school it sort of made me read and do things that I might not pick up on my own you know let me let me google a quick url for you there was a book ironically um that I read when I took CS50 in 1996 and it's by a computer scientist who recently passed named Fred Brooks, who wrote this book, The Myth Mythical Man Month. And it sticks in my mind because it's just been so darn true for decades, even in my own personal experience. And the thesis of the book is essentially that the more people that you add to a project, the slower the project then goes. And so even I, in the real world, kind of envy friends of mine who work at Google or Microsoft or really big companies that have dozens, hundreds, thousands of programmers. Like, my God, just think what they could accomplish. And then here at Harvard CS50, it's it's uh, a colleague of mine named Rong Shin. And, you know, it's me part time or maybe one or two other colleagues that help out part time or full time with writing code. But the reality is, and the, em the emphasis of this book is that there's a sweet spot when you are one person or few people, like your productivity is really high. And the bigger you get, the more process there is, the more red tape or bureaucracy perhaps there is, the more problems that arise, the more communication needs that there arise. And so there's something really interesting there about not programming as an individual, but programming as a team. And so if you have a copy of that or find one online or on Amazon, I would encourage you to read that or at least skim through it because there's some really good um software engineering life lessons in that one that's so interesting thank you sure so the next n hi um i'm ann i'm from illinois um and i was wondering what what would you what advice would you give um like after you complete cs50 like what would be the next steps to continue learning about computer science? Yeah, assuming you don't have classes at your own school, I think that taking at least one other class, either at school or online, that teaches a different type of programming is advantageous. So a class that teaches very specifically like object-oriented programming using a language like C++ or C Sharp or Java or others. Um, we scratch the surface of object-oriented programming in CS50, but only barely when we talk about Python and also uh, JavaScript, but we don't really focus on it in the class. Uh, a class that offers a look at something called functional programming, which we also kind of scratch the surface of with Python and with uh, JavaScript as well, but we don't talk about it uh, with great emphasis in the class. That too is good because it helps round you out as a programmer and you realize that not all languages look like C or look like Python or look like JavaScript. There's different classes of languages, so to speak, that have different features, sometimes overlapping. And so you'll just be, I think, a better software engineer as a result. Um, and beyond that, I think taking an algorithms class um, tends to be a, a good thing. Algorithms and data structures going more deeply into those than something like CS50 does. And I'm just Googling a, a quick URL here. Um, there's a class on Coursera that I usually refer folks to that's taught by a couple of faculty from Princeton, um, one of whom I know well. Um, and so that's the URL of that one, Princeton's Algorithms Part 1, you might really like to. And after that, even if you don't have local classes available to you, I would uh, try to avoid what a lot of you might know as tutorial hell, where like you're just constantly trying to learn, 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 learn. And there too, it's diminishing returns. And like, what's the point of like learning, 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 if you're not going to take that knowledge out for a spin and apply it somehow? Um, and so I would encourage you after taking one or two or three or few courses, like just go find a, a project of personal interest to you and go build something, go solve some problem for yourself, someone else, but stop at some point waiting for a teacher to tell you what to do. Thank you. Sure. Awesome. So next up we have Yvonne. Hi, my name is Yvonne. I'm from the Bahamas. 
How do you approach teaching computer science to students with different levels of experience or background knowledge? It's really hard. Um, here on campus, for instance, we have even even though you know there's a lot of har smart students at Harvard, like some of them have more experience, some of them have less experience. And so really at any level, any university, any community college, any high school, you really do see a spectrum of comfort levels when it comes to technology, especially. So within CS50, both on campus and online, we have different tracks within the class. Like we have problem sets, uh, programming assignments for students more comfortable who've maybe been programming since they were six years old and also for those less comfortable and nowadays as of the past couple of years for those least comfortable and those problems just tend to hold their hand a little bit more they have a, a lower floor metaphorically where it's just a lot easier for students to get on board with the material um, whereas the more comfortable track might have a higher ceiling metaphorically, like there's just more headroom, they can go further with the material as a result. And so you see this in the online version of CS50, there's different problems for those more comfortable or less comfortable. So that's one way. And then also on campus, we don't do this online. We also have different classes in person for students less comfortable and more comfortable alike if only for the psychological upsides of just knowing that like, no, not everyone else in the room is smarter than you, or no, you're not the smartest one in the room. Like you're just among like-minded students with the same comfort or discomfort as you. So we try to do that with the in-person audience too. Thank you. Sure. Okay. And then a question from the chat asked by both Isaac and Ramiz. Uh, would you say having a CS degree is worth it compared to being self-taught? I think that really depends um, on opportunities that are available to you, networks of people you know, depending on what country or city you're in and what uh, volume of opportunities there are. I think there's certainly value in some circles of a traditional university degree. The pedigree that is the reputation of the university can open doors for you. That said, there's so many people out there, some friends of mine who don't have a formal education, didn't choose to or weren't able to go to university and so forth, and so found opportunities themselves. So I think the answer to that question really kind of depends on what's around you uh, culturally, geographically, socioeconomically, or also where you think you might go to or travel to ultimately, because I think the answer is going to depend. I don't think it's a hard yes or no either way. Um, it really depends too on your goals and and opportunities that are near to you. But what's so exciting and honestly just so special about technology and programming and computer science, especially right now, so long as you at least have access to some material resources like a laptop or a computer lab somewhere or a friend's computer or a computer at work, like that's all you need to start creating things and building things and even monetizing things. And there's something that's very enabling about that. You don't need to have access to a lot of physical resources beyond the computer itself. You don't need years and years and years of training just to be able to do something. It's very enabling and therefore for many people vocationally life-changing. And so it's been, I think that's a very exciting field to have an interest in already. So thanks. Uh, so the next uh, person is Piyush. Hi, Professor Millen. My name is Piyush Acharya and I'm a freshman at Interlake High School in Washington State. And it's just super cool getting the opportunity to, opportunity to like meet you. So thanks to Hack Club and you for your time. So I took CS50 a couple months ago and I really enjoyed learning C, Python and like all the web development languages. And I especially like learning like how to think like a software developer. So mm -hmm. my question is, what are some of the most exciting recent developments that you've found interesting in the field of computer science or a new pro uh, programming language that you think students should be like paying attention to? I mean, you can't escape AI nowadays, and it's really been brought to the forefront, of course, by technologies recently like uh, ChatGPT and Dolly last year and the like. And so I think getting some exposure to some comfort with principles of AI, whether on the programming side or on the mathematics side or on the ethics side, I think is certainly a good thing if you can find those locally or online. I think another very enabling technology, honestly, in recent years, at least in many geographies, but certainly not all, has been bandwidth. Like the fact that you and I are all on like this Zoom call, and some of us have better connections than others, but the fact that we're able to video conference from all around the world, and especially during the pandemic, that so many people in certain professions were able to keep working from home and uh, keep each other healthy and safe, like 
the fact that this was possible because of the internet and increased bandwidth speeds is pretty darn game changing. And so I think there's something exciting about assuming um, similar, I think, Maggie, it might have been your question from the very beginning, assuming that money is no object. Well, assume that bandwidth is no object and you have just instantaneous communication at scale, like really interesting things, uh, possibilities open up technologically. So I think thinking along those lines, too, might be timely. Thank you. Sure. Awesome. So next is Shubham. Uh, hello. Um... I'm Shubham. I'm from the Bay Area. Um, so my my main question that I wanted to ask you: How do you feel? What do you feel is like the best way to like get someone who isn't really CS related just taking the class because they need to fulfill a credit? Um, how do you get them actually interested in CS, or is it just like don't force them; they'll figure it out on their own? Oh, you know, it's a good question. Um, I would first stipulate that I don't think everyone has to take an interest in CS or programming. I'm not a fan of re like requiring kids to learn how to program necessarily. Like that seems like the easiest way to turn a student off to some subject, myself included, is by requiring it. I, I think it's much better to let an intrinsic interest or market forces, sort of popularity of fields, uh, govern or guide some student's interest. With that said, I think it is worth trying, certainly if a student has to take a class, to try to find some angle that resonates with them. And as I mentioned earlier in 2007, when we started reinventing some of CS50's homework assignments or problem sets, like it was very deliberate that we tried to choose domains and types of problems that were just very trendy or very relevant or had this cool factor to them, that they weren't just boring traditional problems. Because at some point over the 12 or so weeks of the class, like odds are there's going to be one or more of those problems or worlds that resonates with whoever you're thinking of. And I think that's certainly worth trying. I and mean, I think that's what makes you a good teacher or you a good classmate is to try to find that hook for someone. And not every week is going to stimulate everyone and not every topic is going to resonate. But if you can find enough of that hook, um, I think it's worth trying. And that would make you indeed a, a good educator. But I don't think it's a failure if it just doesn't work for them. Like that's fine. I'm sure they'll find their passion, their interest, their skills somewhere else. Okay, thank you. Sure. The next is Javier. Hello, David. I am Javier Saleta Martinez, and I'm a first year medical student and programmer from the city of Morelia, Mexico. And I'm very happy to, to finally meet you. Likewise. And my question is, what do you think that can be done at CS50 to encourage students to think critically, to avoid using AI tools like ChatGPT all the time that can prevent them from learning on their own? Because those tools can be very helpful, but many students only copy the generate answers for problems instead of us at least trying to write one themselves. And I think this is a situation that has been growing recently in the field of computer science. So I would like to know what are your opinions about this? Yeah, I think this comes back to the topic of ethics in part two. And I think I'm no expert in teaching that field specifically. There's a lot of intersections with the world of philosophy. And we actually collaborate with some of those faculty here at Harvard for the on-campus class about the intersection of technology and ethics. But I think talking about these topics like proactively so that it's not you know, Mark Zuckerberg at home in his dorm room alone deciding whether or not I should make this website that compares the attractiveness of two people. Like, wouldn't have been nice with a scenario like that, assuming it didn't actually happen, to have talked about whether or not you should do something like that just because you have the programming chops. Because I think a lot of students of any age, but particularly younger, might just do stupid things or foolish things because they didn't necessarily think it through. And I think that alone is like the teaching opportunity, like create opportunities, have classroom discussions where you ask, should you do this? Should you do that? And get people kind of debating so that they have a mental model for how they would answer that question themselves if they find themselves in or put themselves in that situation. And as for the other side of ethics, like not doing things too with chat GPT and the like, I mean, I think a lot of this is the fault of our own educational system and classes and teachers and courses where like so many kids don't want to be in certain classes. And like, that's probably not the best use of our time societally 
to be wasting each other's time having year after year after year of like this math class or that or this English class or history class or the like. Like I think especially at the K-12 level, at least in the U.S., we waste so much time going through these motions um, that doesn't really allow students to find their own passions. Because I dare say that many students, most students wouldn't be inclined to like cheat their way through a class on any subject by using chat GPT or the like if they really wanted to be there and they had this intrinsic interest in it and they wanted to learn it and get better at it. So I think we should be optimizing for creating in classrooms, environments, opportunities where for the most part, people want to be there. And even when they might not, because I think the reality is, you know, algebra and calculus isn't going to resonate with everyone, but sometimes you need to have those building blocks for the stuff you really do care about. Figuring out a way to help students realize that like, you know, this will be good for the following reasons and not just telling people do it because I said so or do it because it's in the syllabus. Awesome, yeah. thank you. Sure. So David, we're a global network of high school coders and it's been awesome hearing all of your answers to these questions. And we're curious if you had any questions for us. Yeah, maybe by a show of yes, no vote reactions, how many of you actually have access to computer science or programming classes at your school? Physical hands works fine too. So it looks like a third. Oh, interesting. If you're all using yellow hands, it's hard to tell which thumb is up, which is down by skimming, but that's okay. All right, it's a bit of a mix. We can kind of cheat by looking in the participants window. Okay, so a mix of yes and no's. So, I mean, that's of interest because I think one of our goals with CS50 is to make available, like ideally quality education for anyone and everyone who wants to be able to access it. And there's so much other material online as well. Um, so I think that it's helpful. It's both encouraging and discouraging to know that there's still quite this split, but it's great that you guys have found your, your interest in and way to things like Hack Club um, in the place of uh, fewer opportunities on campus itself. Okay. Uh, next, let's see. Charles? Um, hi, um, I'm Charles. I'm from Canada, Quebec. And I was wondering what were your thoughts on how new AIs like ChatGPT will uh, affect the way we work in programming and if they're going to replace certain jobs uh, in programming? That's a good question. Um, I've not used, so I think the coding analog of ChatGPT is partly Copilot, where GitHub Copilot, Amazon Code Whisperer, and similar technologies out there that are better versions of autocompletes um, in that instead of just prompting you deterministically from a drop down menu, like what function do you want? What arguments do you want? What curly braces do you want closed? Like it gives you the next three lines of code or the next 30 lines of code. Like that's easily a productivity win in industry where you can just get more work done by not having to think through each and every line of code yourself. And I've not used Copilot myself really at all besides tinkering. But a, a former colleague of mine from Harvard who now works for a startup, I mean, he swears by it. And he claims that it has, in fact, increased his productivity by like 30 percent. This is exactly why companies are trying to charge for technologies like this, because, look, you can be 30 percent more productive by, you know, paying five dollars a month or whatever it is for this tool. Um, ChatGPT goes even further where you can write, as you know, uh, English descriptions of the code that you want. And boom, it gets spit out all the more. Um, so I suspect that will just make programming easier over time. I mean, I think a lot of bugs still need to be worked out. You have to still be a programmer to know if the code is right or not, if it's introducing security holes or not. So there's some, uh, it doesn't turn it into no code per se, um, but I think it'll be a productivity boost. And honestly, I don't think it's particularly threatening to computer programmer jobs per se, because We've had people creating libraries for years, and even though it's a little different in just how powerful it, it, the AI stuff is, like libraries have been saving people time for years, and you know, Bootstrap and similar CSS and JavaScript frameworks are saving you a huge amount of time, but it hasn't put programmers out of business. It just means they can be more productive and solve more problems and charge more, for instance, for their, their resources. So I think there's been past examples where we get productivity boosts that tends to be a a net positive, even though there will surely be some some short-term pain points. Ideally, people will 
adapt, certainly in the technical space. Awesome, thank you. So next up is Nada. Um, yes, hello, David. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, I am Nada, I'm from Algeria. And uh, I took in, I'm taking CS50 Python. And I was wondering if I can ask you how you make uh, lectures uh, so interesting. Is it me or is David frozen? Yeah, he is frozen for me as well. We can wait like a minute. Um, it looks like he'll be right back. I'm not sure what happened. So <laughs> hold on there. Um, just because I'm curious, like for everyone that hasn't asked a question yet or introduced yourself, do you want to share where you're like calling from in the chat? Like I'm from Malaysia right now and it's like almost 9 a.m. for me. Sorry about that. So much for good bandwidth nowadays, but hopefully you can hear me now. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, so in answer to your question, Nada, like my response to this is sort of a, a negative motivation. Like my worst fear in life as a teacher is to like for no one in the room to want to be there and for people to be bored. And so I think a lot of what I do is motivated by really this insecurity of like not wanting to be the creator of that kind of experience for folks. And so I think a lot of the the examples, the demonstrations, the energy, and like the exaggerated gestures and so forth are really just a motivated by trying to keep people focused and engaged. And even the rate at which I speak, which I admit is fast, especially if English is not your primary language for some of you, um, that at least with folks who are comfortable at that speed, it sort of forces you, compels you, uh, ideally to stay focused and to zone out with lower probability. So it's a lot of that. And it's a lot of thinking back on bad teachers I had in high school, middle school, college, and since, um, and trying to do the opposite of what those folks did. That totally makes sense. Thank you. Sure, so. So the next person is Bruno. Hi, I'm Bruno. I'm from Argentina, and I would like to ask uh, what career do you think it's the best to study at college or uh, to work in computer science and programming? What the best career is, did you say? Uh, yes. Yeah, I mean, I think first and foremost, ideally should be what your own personal interests or passions are. If you're in a position where you have the luxury of choice, like you should absolutely just try to find your way. And while you're in school, like take classes in computing to find things online, join things like hack clubs so that you just get a sense of like what's out there because odds are you'll start to sort of mentally rank like, oh, I like software better than hardware or vice versa, or I really like AI or really like cybersecurity or the like. And so I think just like taking in lots of data, so to speak, lots of experience can help inform that decision. And then I think in the real world, technologically, depending where you are, or if you can travel beyond like your own town or city, um, you know, there's certainly software engineering jobs. There are jobs that are more focused on hardware or systems and infrastructure, cloud stuff. There's DevOps, which kind of merges the two. There's user interface design and usability and so forth, if you're more artistically inclined or graphically inclined. So I think, um, Try to find what's of interest first. And if you're indeed still in high school, like you have enough years ahead of you to sort of figure out what might resonate with you most. And then keep an eye out for just opportunities, either locally or wherever you travel to. Thank you. 
So just two more questions. Let's have Ova. You said it was 4 a.m. there. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, well, hi, my name is uh, Ova. I'm from Istanbul, Turkey. Senior right now. I'm going to a software engineering degree next year. I've always been interested in programming. I just wasn't sure how to get started. CS50 was that start for me. Honestly, loved your lectures and how you don't just give answers, but kind of lead people into the answers. I like my experience with most of my high school teachers. I was honestly curious how to go from there because I'm kind of lost. Any like resources you would recommend? It's a good question. And I hope you and everyone you know in Turkey, especially lately, are doing okay. Oh, um, thank you. Yeah, I mean, our, our common answer with bias here is certainly to refer folks to other CS50 classes, which have a similar style and are very well connected so that we know what background you have with these other classes. So um, CS50's Python class, not I think mentioned earlier, we have a class on web programming, on game development, um, and more. And so go, I can paste a, a quick URL here. Um, if you go to edX.org slash CS50, there's other courses like that. And then beyond CS50 zone, the go-to is the one I mentioned earlier, the one from Princeton, Coursera's algorithms class. You might find that of interest as well. But after taking just a few classes, I would again encourage you and everyone to just try to find some personal project, like make a website for yourself or for someone else, or go solve some problem that, you know, will write some code that will be used by real people. Like there's something very exciting about that because you'll be driven then by a desire to like fix every bug and add every feature because like people besides you care and that's pretty motivating all right thank you sure okay is zach here do you have a question i am here all right so david this is a question we we kind of have a tradition of asking at hack club amas um so what I want to ask you is, say, you know, an hour ago, when you first got on the Zoom call, when you clicked the link and, you know, Zoom did its thing and asked you want to join with computer audio or not, when you click join with computer audio, suddenly you don't know how it happened. You have no idea, like, what's going on. And you find yourself in the year 500 BC. And you also have the realization that you are on one of three identical Earths in the year 500 BC. Okay. Somehow you look around and everybody around you is treating you like the dictator of the world. So the question is, if you find yourself in the year 500 BC, you're one of three identical worse, and you realize you're on, you know, uh, uh, everyone's treating you like dictator of the world. Sorry. The, the challenge is you come to the realization and you know for a fact that there's going to be a war between these three Earths in 2,523 years from now, in the year 2023. And the challenge and the question is, what would you do to best increase your people's chance of survival? You know everything you know today. Uh, you only have the rest of your lifetime to set your plans in motion. You can, and so that means you only have 50 years or something like that. You're not going to die from some horrible disease. Um, you, it is a year 500 BC, but, and, and you're limited accordingly. So for example, if you say something, who knows the people on the other side of the world will hear it before you die. And um, the war is inevitable. There's nothing you do to prevent it. Um, and you have to best increase, you know, your Earth's chance. What would you do? Okay, this is a very specific scenario. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, I worry this is going to sound cliche or what everyone might say in this audience. Like, I feel like education is just the obvious and only answer. Like, everything we do and are capable of as humans, like, sort of derives from that. And, I mean, jokingly, I'd probably admit, gee, I wish I'd paid more attention in math class, physics class, chemistry class, any science class, because, oh, my God, like, I got to teach it all to someone now. And we're going to have to do a lot of reinventing, I think, if you're dep depending on me. Um, but I think it boils down to education, right? Because uh, if the, the war is inevitable, like, at least having smart people make decisions that are hopefully optimal and thoughtful for not just us, but other people is a good thing. And I think just in general, and in this earth in 2023, like we all benefit from a, an educated citizenry, so to speak. And so just figuring out how to get to that end and wasting a lot less time the next time around than we might in K-12 nowadays. And, and how would you structure that? You know, it's a logistics problem. Like how would you think about educating the world in the year 500 BC? Yeah, I mean, travel is presumably going to be a precondition pretty fast. And I think that 
being a computer scientist, like network effects are sort of necessary to leverage. Like it can't be me or it can't be just one person teaching everyone else. You need some form of exponentiation, presumably, even though the population is presumably smaller in this story. Um, so you teach the teachers and the teachers teach the other teachers and those teachers teach the students and so forth so that you get this um, exponentiation of connectivity. So that's who seems necessary. Beautiful. All right. Well, thank you so much. And really, thank you for joining us tonight. It's It's been so wonderful having you. Yes, likewise. And Albert, I see I might have missed a question of yours. Did Albert, did you want to chat your questions just since you seem very, very eager for this one? Or if someone saw it that I didn't when I disconnected? It's okay if we lost Albert. Well, Albert, if you want to relay your question through Maggie or or Zach or any of the team, happy to try to field it over email. And that goes for those of you too. Like Arpan, I still see your hand up and Sakil, if I'm saying that right. And Jaden, um, do feel free to email Zach or Maggie or others on the team and they can put you in touch with me via email. Or if you Google any CS50 video, my email address is in the video. Yeah, if we could send all like the unanswered questions in the chat and maybe if anyone has any after in the Slack, would that be okay? Sure. Yeah, please do that. Albert as well. Relay them afterward if you could. Albert just put his question in if you want to just take that one, oh. David. Uh, Albert, let me do that one over email just so I can answer yeah. it more thoughtfully, especially since I know it's it's 4 a.m. for some of you. All right. So thank you so much, David, for spending the time with us today. Okay. But yeah, so nice to meet you all. Thank you for staying awake or waking up for this. Yeah, thank you so much. And it was super cool to like listen to your thoughts on CS education and also like learning programming. So thank you so much for spending the time with us today. Yes, of course. All the best. All right. See ya. Honestly, thank it was you. a pleasure. Bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Zach. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.